Good evening. I'm Brent Latham. I'm the Dean of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, which is the newest academic division of America's oldest Catholic seminary. I welcome you here tonight, whether you are here in the room or here through the Zoom. Welcome. Now, in case you don't know, tonight's dual modality of room and Zoom is how we offer all of our programs in St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, our MA in Theology or MA in Christian Ministries, our Doctor of Ministry, and our certificates in Bible or Spirituality, or our Certificate of Advanced Studies, which often focuses on Scripture and is directed by Dr. Mike Gorman. Whether you live or work just around the corner from this beautiful building, or somewhere around the country, Tennessee, New York, Florida, or around the globe. We currently have a student in Kenya. Whether you're here or there, you can join our excellent ecumenical learning community. Though, that said, tonight is a different kind of room and Zoom than our normal classroom experience in two key ways. First, nobody is getting graded, not even our illustrious speaker. And second, we're using Zoom in our webinar mode, which means that the dispersed attendees can see us, but we, we don't see them. And after the lecture, during the Q&A portion, we'll invite those attending through Zoom to type questions into the Q&A uh, window, and those will be curated by my uh, Associate Dean, Dr. Rebecca Hancock, uh, as we uh, alternate questions from the room and questions from the Zoom. Now, since its founding in 1968, the Ecumenical Institute has striven not only to be an engaging learning community, but to engage our community, both Baltimore and beyond. This is because our animating motto is faith-seeking understanding, understanding making a difference. So last year, two of our senior faculty members taught a course called Violence and the City. This coming January, we'll offer Connect, our year-long certificate for those committed to making a difference at the intersection of faith, health, and medicine. That is doctors and nurses and medical social workers, chaplains, clergy, and laypersons. But this fall, the community we have sought to engage most robustly through two courses is the community of creation. Our Jewish Christian Studies course, co-taught by Rabbi Nina Carden and Dr. Rebecca Hancock, is an interfaith engagement with creation in our scriptures and our traditions. And our course on the moral and spiritual vision of Wendell Berry, taught by Dr. Brian Volk, finds itself it eloquently and inexorably engaging the gift of creatureliness. So tonight, we wanted to extend that curricular engagement to all of you. And to do so, we have invited Dr. David Cloutier. Dr. Cloutier and I met long before either one of us was a doctor, <laughs> back when we were graduate students at Duke. And even then, even as a fellow graduate student, I recognized that he was someone we should be eager to hear, to read, and to study. His subsequent career has proven that true. Now an associate professor of moral theology, uh, <laughs> now an associate professor of moral theology at Catholic University of America. He's the author of several really good books, not just the author of several books, but of several really good books, one of which I only own on Kindle. So that's his. He's also a regular columnist for Column Wheel and U.S. Catholic Magazine. I've heard Dr. Cloutier give scholarly papers to roomfuls of moral theologians, but I've also heard him address more general public when he was a panelist right here in Laubacher Hall right after Laudato Si was released. And every time I hear him, 
I marvel at his capacity to present a complex moral matter clearly, yet without simplification, insightfully, yet without intellectual pride, and relevantly, yet without polemics, the kinds of hand grenades that scholars like to throw at one another. So who is better to lead us deeper into engagement with creation than the award-winning author of Walking God's Earth, the Environment and Catholic Faith? Who better than this wise, humble, charitable scholar to ask a hard question like, is anything natural? understanding the concept of nature in an age of frenzy. Please join me in welcoming our speaker for the evening. Thank you, thank you all for being here. Thank you for Zoom people being here and thank you for uh, Dr. Hancock for welcoming me and making all the arrangements and for uh, Dr. Latham for inviting me and also giving that introduction, which really is a high bar, right? <laughs> I was going over my talk and I'm like, is it really, is it really going to live up to what, what he said? Um, but but really, I'm 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 grateful to be here and uh, I look forward to the discussion following our our presentation. So what is natural? Is Zoom natural? Talking to you. Um, is it natural to have storms and floods? How many is it natural to have? Is it natural to drive vehicles everywhere every day? Is it natural to eat something called FDC Blue One, which I believe was in this, this mint that I had before, before the talk? Or is it, is, is it even natural to eat something called natural flavor, which is my favorite ingredient in my Breyers All Natural Vanilla Ice Cream, which says made with cream, milk, and sugar, big on the label. And then you go to the ingredients and it turns out it's cream, milk, sugar, and natural flavor. What do you think that is? Is it natural to have a sabbatical from your work? I'm currently on sabbatical. I'm very grateful um, to be able to do the scholarly work that's possible on a sabbatical. But I have to say, whenever I run into someone and I describe my current situation, they tend to look at, look at me and, and hopefully not resentfully and say, I wish I had one of those. Um, and I think that's right. I would love to, to think about a, na a national sabbatical program where you could buy, buy out six months of your, your work in order to do something else. I think it would be very, very humane and natural. Um, is, is it natural to think that you might be trapped in the wrong body? Is it natural to keep chickens locked up in cages to lay eggs all their lives? Finally, is it natural to believe in God? In our economy and our analysis of human behavior, and especially in our discussions of the global environmental crisis, we are constantly bombarded with claims that this or that is not natural, indeed that we are destroying nature. But what are the standards we use to support that ubiquitous word, natural? As we shall see, arguments about the nature of nature <laughs> have a long history as far back as in the Western philosophical tradition goes. Even just in the history of the English language, Raymond Williams defines nature as, quote, perhaps the most complex word in the language. But it is especially hard to sort these matters out in our frenzied age. Cultures have always experienced controversy and change but I use the term frenzy to mark a kind of unprecedented speed increase in our environmental and cultural order. Speed, of course, has been the hallmark of modern life, at least since the late 18th century. The advent of factory production, of railroad transportation, and of communication instantly over a distance, just to name three things, all had dramatic effects on the speed of life. However, what Environmental historians John McNeil and Peter Engelke call the great acceleration is really about the expansiveness and magnitude of this acceleration, mostly in the second half of the 20th century. 
just in terms of population growth, the world had about 800 to 900 million people in 1780. By 1930, that number had increased to 2 billion. But compare this to the increase to 7 billion in 2011. Now, don't do the percentages. Just think in raw numbers. That's 5 billion more people in, 19, in 2011 than in 1930. That means that we have added more than five times the entire world population in 1780 in the span that is less than my father's lifetime. Similarly, the increases in production, in fossil fuel use, in all sorts of key environmental variables has dramatically increased. For example, nitrogen synthesis for fertilizer was under 4 million tons in 1950. We fed the world um, and we only needed 4 million tons of fertilizer. Today, over 85 million tons of synthesized fertilizer. So this time span we're discussing is fleeting in terms of geologic history. But the authors note, almost all of us alive have experienced only this dramatically accelerating world. And the acceleration of change is also cultural. In his analysis of postmodernity, David Harvey notes what he calls an intense phase of time-space compression in the development beyond Fordism. Fordism is his name for the kind of life that was developed in the late 19th and early 20th century around factory life and standardized production. Um, he suggests that we have moved out of Fordism into a phase he calls flexible accumulation in which, this is quoting him, fashions, products, production techniques, labor processes, ideas and ideologies, even values and established practices experience intense volatility and ephemerality, think TikTok, um, leading to serious economic and social disorientation, which then breeds social conflicts. Now, it's true that humans are adaptable creatures. It's part of our nature. But we do best with gradual change against a backdrop of cultural stability. And note, Harvey documents all this disorientation in, his book was published in 1989, before most people had heard of something called the internet. I do wonder what the teenager of today would think of the pace of the world I experienced as an urban teenager in 1989. They would probably think it was glacial. That's how much time and space have compressed in our age. Now, this period of aggressive rapid acceleration shows no signs of stopping. And in the midst of this, it is imperative that we recover some sense of the natural. In the first part of this paper, I explain that we are caught between two very limited and contradictory images of nature as a, con a concept of nature as fundamentally mechanical, and then a reaction against this view that associates what is natural with what is completely spontaneous. To escape this dichotomy, we need to recover in a new way certain key elements of pre-modern accounts of nature in conversation with the basic worldview of the Bible, uh, from which, interestingly, the concept of nature is largely absent. More on that later. From this, I want to distill two key claims that I hope are kind of the takeaways uh, uh, from the talk, and then I will conclude on a practical note. Our most pressing challenge is that we may be able to understand nature correctly on a global level and on an individual level, but we encounter great difficulties on what I will call the meso or middle level on how common social institutions and structures could be structured according to nature or not. Okay, so let's start with these two common misconceptions. I will call them the natural as mechanical and the natural as spontaneous. First, the natural as mechanical. When we hear about the laws of nature, we immediately think back to our science classes, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of gravity, our imagination of these laws is almost inevitably mechanical, especially since we often learned about them through some kind of mechanical experiment. We imagine the natural world around us as a bunch of gears. Hence, we fall right into what Pope Francis calls the technocratic paradigm, an unrestrained exploitation of things that have no meaning in themselves, that are just mechanisms that we can manipulate. 
Now, I always use the cow as my example. One can use the cow as a milk machine or as a beef machine, but this involves distorting many aspects of the cow's existence as a cow. Its natural existence is not simply as a set of mechanisms. The problem is not that humans use animals or other parts of nature. The technocratic paradigm that Francis criticizes is about how we use them, because we think of them as manipulable mechanical things. Of course, this understanding has also been applied to humans themselves, as Barry Schwartz powerfully argues in his book called The Battle for Human Nature. The modern university, he says, involves a struggle between the language of science and the language of morality for hegemony in describing what it means to be a person. Who gets to describe what it means to be a person? The moralists and the philosophers or the psychologists and the biologists? Well, we know who's winning. Schwartz, a secular Jewish psychologist, explains at great length how the basic paradigms of economics, evolutionary biology, and psychological behaviorism all attempt to atomize and objectify human behavior according to these same sorts of mechanical laws. We humans, too, are mechanisms. This temptation to view the natural world as fundamentally mechanical has a history. R.G. Collingwood quite richly describes the developments in early modernity whereby classical views of nature diverse to be sure, but with certain commonalities, the most important of which was that all viewed nature as a living organism, gave way to what he calls a Renaissance view, which emphasized nature as mechanical. This shift denies intrinsic meaning or value or significance, but even more importantly, denies the idea of intrinsic activity. That is the idea that the principle of movement or activity for a thing was something innate to it, not merely some external force. We tend to uh, image activity of things as merely a matter of some external inputs causing reactions, and then they cause further, further reactions. And crucially, we can know all those reactions and manipulate them. Now, in reaction against such a mechanical hegemony, centuries of thinkers typ typically labeled romantics sought to preserve unspoiled nature and also the core of the human person from this mechanical analysis. In English class, we all read romantic nature poetry that typically involves a wandering observer offering observations about his or her affective responses, affective, the affective, how, how does nature make me feel, um, that they have to natural, and of course, natural means unspoiled um, or spontaneous landscape. Indeed, such a view sometimes even suggests that what is truly natural is the world without humans, or at least without civilized humans. We, or at least our efforts at civilization, are kind of like an invasive species. Humans are unnatural. Um, uh, and then, the, of course, this romantic, spontaneous view of nature could be applied to human nature as well. The most natural human life was simply our spontaneous affective responses, somehow untainted by civilizing influences. Rousseau gave us the classic picture of the naturally good human person as one completely free from any distortions of society. And for Rousseau, all morality is founded on natural feelings of spontaneous self-love and fellow feeling with others, and thus Morality simply is the unthwarted and unprevented development of man's natural passions and feelings. The romantic reaction to mechanism thus established a non-reason-based affective account of nature and especially human nature. It dichotomized the world, dividing it into areas where we apply mechanical reason ruthlessly and others where we avoid any kind of reason at all, focusing on our feelings. As Jean Porter notes, one of the legacies of modern romanticism is that we see nature and reason as contrasts. The outcome of such a focus on human affectivity is what Francis describes as misguided anthropocentrism that he says ends up in practical relativism in which human beings place themselves at the center and regard everything else in terms of how it serves their feelings and desires. Because 
what could judge our desires? They seem to be the most natural thing that we have. It's almost like I feel, therefore I am, becomes the slogan. This basic confusion, nature as mechanism or nature as spontaneous unspoiled thing, creates all sorts of dichotomies in our approach to the world. We find wilderness places in Appalachia protected from any development alongside mountaintop removal mining that completely annihilates every natural aspect of the landscape in service to lifestyles that we may think are just natural. Um, or we find human psychology emphasizing the total self-determination of one's sex and gender, ultimately based on one's supposedly spontaneous feelings, of course, and at the same time, focusing on manipulating brain chemistry to produce people who act normally in other ways. Francis sums this up. This situation has led to a constant schizophrenia, wherein a technocracy which sees no intrinsic value in lesser beings coexists with the other extreme. There can be no ecology without an adequate anthropology. So let's stop this craziness. These are crazy views, and especially the nutty fluctuation between seeing humans as completely sovereign and able to do whatever they want, and seeing humans as some kind of unnatural invasive species between mountaintop removal and wilderness parks. How might Christianity address these problems? Well, first, we have to confess our sin. Christian thought and practice has contributed to these problematic views of nature. These things happened on Christendom's watch, and while they may not have been caused by Christians directly, Christian thought allowed for them, and we need to give an account of how and why. This complicity, I think, can be connected to two mistaken beliefs about God and one mistaken moral belief about our lives as disciples. The two mistakes about God are about allowing God to leave the world. For a variety of reasons in the period from about the 1400s through the 1700s, Christian thinkers slowly but surely lost hold of what might be called a sacramental worldview, one in which the ongoing activity of God in the world is natural all around us, happening all the time. Charles Taylor calls this the great disembedding taking material creation and the social order out of any kind of larger sacred ontology, larger sacred vision of, of the way things are. This movement did not immediately abandon God or Christianity, but rather it concentrated belief in God in two places. One outside the world with a deistic sense of the absent creator and two internal to the individual soul. The first belief played right into understanding the world as a mechanism. Take Paley's famous argument from design, right? Which uses the image of the world as a watch. There's the mechanistic image of the deist God. In such a context, Hans Jonas writes that the universe is still created by God, but this God is essentially an unknown God and is not discernible in the pattern of creation. He says, whereas the things of nature used to reveal God's beauty, goodness, and wisdom, and if we think about the scriptural text, right, they, they're all, the, the heavens are telling the glory of God, the sun, the moon, the, the lion cubs warring for their prey, um, it, it's all, all of this manifests um, the glory of God. Um, whereas the things of nature used to reveal these things, they now solely reveal God's power as maker. That's striking. And the second belief, the idea that God is simply within me, because God is not animating the whole world anymore, played right into a sense that my deepest inner feelings are in fact God at work within me. It is then a short step to Ralph Waldo Emerson, who rejects all the sacredness of tradition and proclaims, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind, a mind that he knows by impulses that make up his unique nature. Um, Nancy Murphy strikingly shows how the problem of divine action comes about because we start to understand scientific knowledge in a particular way. The hallmarks of modern science are atomism and reductionism. That is the idea that all reality is made up of small parts 
called atoms, and that the behavior of wholes, chemicals, organisms, persons, can be explained by the behavior of the component parts. That is, the laws of physics, she says, determine the behavior of the atoms, and the behavior of the atoms determines the behavior of all the larger wholes of which they are a part. Now, within such a worldview, divine action in the world seems to require a choice between interventionism, God occasionally pops in and disrupts the mechanisms, right? Or immanentism, God is simply kind of pervasive like the force um, uh, through everything. Um, each of these views um, uh, is, is problematic in certain ways. Um, and in, in such a system, any top-down causation from God must be of the intervening sort. But as Murphy goes on to explain, quote, it is now coming to be widely recognized that interactions at the lower levels cannot be predicted by looking at the structure of those levels alone. Higher level variables, which cannot be reduced to lower level properties or processes, have genuine causal impact. Chemical reactions do not work the same in a flask as they do within a living organism. Um, another analogy here is um, the increasing science about the way in which attitudes and various ways of coping with illness actually help you through a healing process, right? That somehow the mind actually does have an effect on, on the body. Um, thus, even science, at least at its theoretical level, is not mechanistic and reductionistic anymore, but the popular perception remains the of nature having mechanisms. So the other mistake, um, uh, besides removing God from the world in these two ways, the moral mistake is neglecting obvious Christian teaching and discipline about wealth and comfort. This is perhaps most clearly seen in the reckless Christian sponsorship of the colonizing of the new world and eventually most of the rest of the world with grave consequences for both indigenous humanity and the environment. The centuries of colonial conquest were always given a Christian packaging and certainly there was much valuable missionary activity that went along with them. But what their actual practice demonstrated was a ruthlessness in finding and exploiting natural and human resources for the sake of wealthy classes. That's just what happened. Um, that Christian voices like Las Casas tried to fight against this error is admirable, but frankly, they were voices crying in the wilderness. The fact that Christians did not speak up against this desire for wealth and comfort lies at the heart of this colonial need to, to appropriate the word. So what more precisely were the uses for which the Greek, Greeks found the term appropriate? We can, and non-exhaustively, I know there are philosophers in the room, so I, I, I make no pretensions to exhaustiveness here. The first, well, I'm naming two. The first was an explanation of the internal identity and activities of particular things. Collingwood describes this as, quote, something within or intimately belonging to a thing which is the source of its behavior. Early Greek philosophers first sought explanations of, uh, of nature in terms of a thing's matter. A thing's nature was what things were made of. But even before Plato, there was a movement towards an alternative understanding of nature as a thing's structure, which came to be called its form. For Plato, these forms were transcendent realities, but Aristotle is typically taken to suggest that a thing's form is not some separated ideal, but rather the thing's activities towards distinctive ends. Aristotle writes, nature is an end, telos, since what we say the nature of each thing is, is what it is when it's coming into being is completed. So to say that a dog has a certain nature is to say that dogs characteristically uh, act in particular ways towards particular ends. Human nature, unlike animals, also requires habituation to reach its ends, for it is natural for humans to use reason and live in communities. But we are also animals. Gene Porter nicely summarizes how medieval Christians made sense of all this by speaking of human nature in two harmonized ways. Speaking on the one hand of nature as nature, the way in which we shared something in common with all the animals, 
and nature as reason, whereby we had a distinctively human way of life that was natural to us. The second key Greek use for the term came when applying this distinction to the social life of human beings. Socrates famously challenges the idea that it is natural for human beings to seek their own advantage by any means, so long as they have the power to avoid punishment. This distinction attempts to discover what is natural for human social life, contrasted with what is merely customary or conventional. Put bluntly, is justice natural? Or is human community really the rule of the strongest? Is that natural? Justice is merely the idea of the weak that they devise to bind the strong. Now, these two uses, the intrinsic activity and judging custom, had an underlying commonality in that they sought explanations of reality according to nature as what would happen without the interference of an alien causality. We could say that the term nature plays a non-interference role in both physics and politics um, in the material world and in human social life. But Non-interference of what? Now, in both cases, the key for the Greeks was this. The appeal to nature arose as an alternative to the appeal to the supernatural interference of the gods. The Greeks sought in nature rather than the gods an account of pre-existing order internal to things themselves and internal to human beings and their social relationships. Now, the Hebraic traditions of the Old Testament clearly believe in a pre-existing physics of the world's creatures, see Genesis 1, but also lots of other parts of the Hebrew Bible, as well as a politics of proper human social order. Did you notice how many social laws there are in the Old Testament? But it is never even remotely conceived as a kind of autonomous thing in itself. Rather, both the physics and the politics are manifestations of the one true God, Israel's God. The issues about conceiving the material world and the political order in contrastive relationship to the gods never came up for Israel, because Israel starts with a rejection of such gods, such mythological gods, as the fundamental characteristic of its worldview. But God was clearly sovereign over the whole thing. Israel did not need to appeal to any concept of nature to adjudicate among social customs and figure out what justice was. It had the Torah, God's own judgments rendered in law. They did not need to appeal to nature to explain animal behavior or the seas or anything. They simply saw these as manifestations of the power and glory of God, the same God who had freed the Israelites from slavery by sending locusts and manifesting plagues and parting the Red Sea. So we should pause to acknowledge the striking difference here. The whole Old Testament, as well as so much of the Gospels, simply asks us to recognize God all over the place in what we would now call the natural order and the social order. But the terms, so this term's contrast function was not needed. God's activity in the world is not to be understood as some kind of outside force intervening. The worldview depicted simply refuses the idea that God and created reality, God and creatures, are in some kind of competitive, rivalrous, either or, zero sum relationship, as it obviously also tries to curb and ultimately overcome human tendencies towards rivalrous social relationships. We're not in a zero sum, either or so social situation with other human beings either. So given this biblical worldview where the, the conflicts that the, the Greeks in, engaged didn't appear, um, what were the problems that led Christian thinkers to utilize the language of nature? Here we can start to piece together what we might need today. Two are historically important. The first was the confrontation of the early church with Gnosticism, a confrontation which required a vigorous defense of the integrity and goodness of the whole natural order. This not only is required by the truth of the incarnation and the sacraments, 
but also maintains a sense that the created world is hospitable to humans, that it is a home for them rather than something from which an alien God must help them escape. The, the second use uh, for nature that came into the Christian tradition was the medieval recovery of claims about natural law, per, 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 uh, particular about human society here, to address changes in the social order. Jean Porter notes that natural law appeals became particularly important in the Middle Ages because of rapidly changing social forms and structures, not as rapid as ours, but they were facing some serious social change in the early Middle Ages, and all of which might appeal in piecemeal fashion to scripture for their warrant. In other words, all of them tried to appeal to scripture. Having already determined in Acts 15 that Gentiles need not adopt the fullness of the Torah to govern all of their lives, how was a Christian society to deal with these new changes, these new structures? The answer was to identify what was in accordance with the natural law, which was, of course, also in accordance with the right reading of scripture. And how did one discover the content of the natural law? By reason and not by feeling. So today we need to refurbish these two essential claims about a Christian physics, about God animating the world and not trying to make us escape from the world. Um, and a Christian politics of natural communities in God. We need first to develop the eyes and hearts to see God's ordering and saving power and love in everything. We should never be tempted to worship nature, but we also need to resist the Gnosticizing of our faith into something invisible, otherworldly, or purely interior. We need to see God at work in the world. And here we should think about the reference that I made to Nancy Murphy's work before. It's much easier in today's science, not the science that we learn in sixth grade, but today's science, to see God at work within the world rather than simply taking an interventionist view. We must respond to the created order, all things in the created order, with humbled delight, awe, fear of the Lord in the biblical sense. And this last fear of the Lord cannot be forgotten. Nature evokes gratitude sometimes, but it should also humble us. Its complexity should especially keep us cognizant of the limits of our manipulative prowess over the world. This does not mean that humans can't use nature. It's not a call to some kind of hunter-gatherer or gatherer only lifestyle. It means tilling and keeping is good as long as the tilling does not overrun the keeping, to use Francis's use of Genesis 2. In the age of frenzy, we may discuss how far we have exceeded the, the limits, but there should be no debate that we have gone beyond them on a scale never before seen in human history. And God will not ultimately allow us to destroy God's creation. We, we people will suffer destructions first, and that's also biblical. So secondly, we need to realize that claims about nature are needed to adjudicate among social customs. That is, uh, in any society and in any age, we need to talk about what is natural for human beings because we need to sort through changing customs in a society and figure out which ones are okay and which ones are not. We cannot do whatever we feel like. We also cannot make social decisions by simply following the science. The science does not direct human behavior, nor would I add that we can simply follow the Bible as if we could just read off moral and social order from the Bible's pages. We have to, in fact, make judgments about what just human relations are. Now, the most obvious example here, for Catholic, certainly, is to ask what aspects of our sexual customs are natural. You want to get a crowd going. There's your question. What aspects of our sexual customs are natural? And we should do so in accordance with nature as reason, 
Now, there are a range of possible answers here, but it's not an infinite range. It's not whatever we happen to feel like. And it's not answers that can simply be read off of science. Science won't give us the answers to that. Um, but in the context of the environmental crisis, we need to do the same thing to identify particular relationships of economic and political justice that are natural and then judge our economic and political customs by these natural communal relationships. Here again, just as tilling is not in excluded, the point is not to criticize everything that is a custom, as if we could imagine a human society without customs, uh, without any artifices like wedding customs that surround the practice of marriage and family. One need not reject custom. One simply has to submit what is customary to a higher bar, what is truly in accord with natural community, which is just relations between humans. I want to highlight this as perhaps the most important single piece of conceptual clarification for nature that we need for our context to be able to distinguish without dichotomizing nature and custom, and to be able to subject our customs to critique by nature without reducing nature to some biophysical mechanism. Now, anyone familiar with Christian environmental thought over the past few decades will find much familiar material here, even if it is oriented to stress particular points. But it is striking and perhaps depressing to see how little impact such ideas have actually had in our churches and in our world. In both America and Europe, sadly, strong environmentalists and Christian believers have in fact drifted into opposing political movements, leaving us with an unsatisfactory secular environmentalism, which cannot actually get clear on nature, and an environmentally negligent Christianity. So whatever the prognosis for that political division is, I want to suggest in my conclusion here that our lack of real progress has a lot to do with neglecting the meso level or the middle level of life, not the broad philosophical worldview we have or the day-to-day -day individual choices we might make, but the communities and institutions in which we go about our lives. At the macro level, awareness about environmental problems is quite high. Nominally, a solid majority of people are unlikely to support the kind of raping and pillaging of raw material that used to be countenanced. Churches of all sorts have projects for creation care. Um, at the micro level, people make choices that they understand as consistent with, with saving nature or loving nature, even though some of those choices might be questionable, but being green is clearly more and more of a social virtue. People hike in the mountains, they go to farmer's markets, and I could go on, right? They may even go uh, so far as pursuing the virtue that Francis in Laudato Si calls sobriety. He calls this a, a capacity to be happy with little and to experience what it means to appreciate each person and each thing learning familiarity with the simplest things and how to enjoy them. And he contrasts this. Francis is a great Pope of contrast. He loves giving you like images like Jesus in the parables where there are, there are two sons, right? Um, so he contrasts this person who is sober, who is happy with little, ex appreciates each person and each thing. He contrasts this with those who are dipping here and there always on the lookout for what they do not have. That is, people individually may actually follow Francis and say, I need to live more deeply the relationships and the place where I actually am. But at the meso level, it's much more difficult. How might we imagine a university or a seminary community that conducted itself and its affairs according to nature? Or how might we imagine a food system or healthcare system or energy system that followed this paradigm? In fact, virtually all of the institutional and cultural forces push in the opposite direction, the direction of, of technocracy and self-expression. 
I call attention to this meso level because I'm convinced, as Wendell Berry has put it best, I think the environmental crisis, while it may be global, cannot be addressed and solved at the global level. Instead, we need real functioning human communities and systems, meso level things, that show the world what it looks like for a group of people to live according to nature to recognize the limits of both natural and social justice and develop a vision and culture consistent with those limits. Developing such group efforts at alternative ways of life is the fundamental challenge we must offer to the age of frenzy. Changing worldviews and changing ourselves one by one, that's good. The big worldview, individual actions, that's good. But changing the day-to-day -day institutions and social relationships in which we live, that's where the real long-lasting change happens. We need to develop what I've been calling natural communities, groups and institutions that abide by this deeper, authentic Christian vision of nature and God. Now, you're wondering, what, what should these communities look like? I know that everyone thought of back to the land communes or the Amish, right? Um, uh, those look like natural communities. If our meso level imaginations are limited to these examples that we're not going to follow, right? We're just not going to follow them. Um, uh, nothing will ever happen. So my example tends to be from my college experience. Now, many people, of course, love their college years, and it does have a commune-like feel. But even by college standards, my small Minnesota college was different in two key ways. First, almost no one was allowed to have a car on campus. If you lived over 500 miles away, you could drive a car to campus and put it in cold storage. It is Minnesota, right? Cold storage. Um, and, and so you could drive it dump it in a parking lot, and then drive it back home after the 10-week semester. Otherwise, no cars. Um, second, circa early 1990s, remember, there were almost no televisions on campus. And so television played hardly any role in anybody's life and therefore in the collective life of the community. And we were not bored all the time. We were definitely not bored. Um, those two things, the living without color, I mean, I grew up like any normal kid in the 80s, so it's, the TV is part of life, right? Um, those two things transformed both my life and the collective life that I experienced. And what we see there is the crucial lesson that we all need to learn from the Amish, that we have to be selective about technologies in light of how they affect the community's basic way of life and its aims. Pope Francis insists on the same thing when he warns in Laudato Si that technologies are not neutral. And he says, technological choices are really choices about the kind of society we want to build. You get the idea. The point is to start thinking collectively, not, it just doesn't have to be about TVs, but start thinking collectively at the meso level in churches, businesses, schools, maybe even HOAs, about how to escape from the age of frenzy recognize limits, and live community more naturally. Let me pull out two points that may be especially important for a theological audience. First, these need to be communities that are truly centered on God in the right way, not, not my college, to be, to, be care, to be fair, very secular place. What I mean by this is that is God understood as manifest in everything we experience, as I described before, and God as active in history to complete his work, that God has a project, and God's working on completing the project. We get help. It's not our project. It's God's project. Um, this challenges us because I think our communities have tended either to be centered on God, but by focusing mainly on acts of piety and ritual practice, which are not bad, um, uh, but teach us to see God in a kind of limited way, or to rebel against that by pursuing an activism that implies or actually sings that we are building the city of God, right? Centering on God can't end up being Pelagianism. It certainly shouldn't be spiritual privatism. All of this is a way of getting what we mean by God right in our actual practices. If we don't get God right, we won't get nature right. And to the focus of this lecture, we should realize how God's participation in all created reality is glorious. 
far more glorious than our man-made monuments to our own hubris. So secondly, such natural communities are going to be groups and institutions that get the principle of subsidiarity right. Subsidiarity is often misunderstood as an anti-government or anti-big principle. In fact, it developed in Catholic social thought as a principle about finding the proper level at which we achieve common goods. The proper level at which we achieve common goods. Subsidiarity means that, for example, governments or large corporations should not run symphony orchestras or families. Rather, they should, as they often do, help the symphony orchestra or the family achieve its own proper common good. This is why if you ran a symphony for profit, a business, the business would run the symphony to make the most amount of money, which would <laughs> undoubtedly lead to certain problems with the symphony actually being a great symphony. So it's not simply that small is beautiful, though in our age of giantism, we likely need to downsize our communities. Rather, it is all about the proper scale for achieving genuine common goods in an activity. I mean, intrinsic to these goods is a real participation in the shared activity, the way each player has to contribute to the team and if the team is run well, but each player has a clear sense of their action and its contribution. Subsidiarity is asking what's the right size and then using the genuine common goods of the community and the need for everyone to participate in them to answer that question about right size. Both of these things, focusing on God in everything and right sizing our communities should slow us down at the meso level. They should make life more clunky rather than merely focusing on maximizing efficiency or results. In both cases, I think we also have a shot at achieving some kind of harmony or at least e equilibrium with the beautiful limits of nature, both of the planet and of human nature. Now, of course, we need to get the bigger pieces right, too. We have to reject this mechanical view of the world and the spontaneity-based view of human flourishing. Um, we need to recover an idea of nature as intrinsically worthwhile and fundamentally alive. And we need to subject any culture, our own and others, to critiques of how customs distort what human nature is really made for. But we will do this best by establishing meso-level communities that get it right as a lived set of embodied shared practices. I wish I could just say, improve the recycling program at your church. But being so far along in the age of frenzy, we also need to realize that this is good, but it is not enough to save nature. Thank you.